Okay, so this is a bit where I sort of go alone because I can't see you guys. So I, I'm kind of talking to my computer. So hopefully uh, you'll feel that I'm engaging with you and I'll, I'll do my very best uh, to do that. Um, this talk, which is about the painting Peter the Great at Deptford Dockyard, is part of ongoing work that I've been doing to explore previously unheard voices in the collection. Um, and as I said, when I first arrived here, I had been wanting to do more research into this picture. And I think one of the things that really was compelling me, I'll actually just show you the picture now, here is the painting, um, was that in 2005, when I was uh, just starting out my PhD in art history, I went to an exhibition called Black Victorians, which uh, went to Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery and Manchester as well. And it was really eye-opening. It was really um, very inspiring for me because the 19th century is my time period. And I really enjoyed how it made people who seemingly were um, invisible, visible again. Um, and this painting has really caught my interest because of the figure who um, you'll see if you look pretty much in the center of the picture, just under the, the hammer or the anvil that's being thrown, um, you'll see a black figure there. And that's really intrigued me all this time. The other reason that I wanted to explore it is my previous role was curator of British art at National Museums Liverpool. And I looked after another painting by the artist Daniel McLeese, The Death of Nelson there um, at the Walker Art Gallery. And in that painting, among the chaos of the battle, were two black figures. Um, and likewise, again, in this painting, we have a black figure by the same artist. And it just made me want to explore why was McLeese inserting these figures? Was he the only Victorian painter doing this? Um, and I wanted to know more. I have to admit that this talk is not a perfectly polished piece of research. Um, I'm really seeing it as the beginning um, of a journey for me with this painting. And I suspect that the deeper I go in, the more I'm going to have an understanding. But I really wanted to talk to you about the research I've been doing so far. And I'm seeing it really as a springboard to more research and one of the many, many steps that I'm going to have to take to decolonize the collections. So to start with, oh, I just, I can show you, there is the, the Black Victorians exhibition catalog. And um, to start with, I thought I better tell you a little bit about MacLeese, um, because he's probably not a sort of the, the household name that some of the other artists in the picture gallery are, like Landseer or Frith or Burne Jones, other people in the collection. Um, and actually, when I was looking for an image of him, I found this wonderful photograph, which is the very year that he painted Peter the Great in Deptford Dockyard. So really, this is the artist that you're, you're seeing his work. This is very much him. And Daniel McLeese was born in Cork in Ireland in 1806, and his talent for drawing was discovered at really quite an early age. Um, his father had been a soldier in the British Army, um, but he wasn't wealthy. He was on half pay, which um, actually lot, quite a lot of artists I know, their fathers were, were working on half pay. So money, you know, was quite tight. And his father was scraping by with a tanning and shoemaking business. Um, but he realized that his son's drawings were really quite good. So he started putting them up in his shop. And soon art collectors and patrons were coming to the shop to buy the works. Um, and it was these patrons in Cork that really encouraged him and funded his tuition to the Cork School of Art. In fact, one of them gave him an art studio in his house. So he really had some phenomenal support back in Cork. And then... Um, as MacLeese graduated from the Cork School of Art, he then began painting portraits um, and was very successful in his hometown doing this. But really the main aim for him to do this was to get enough money together to move to London to attend the Royal Academy schools, uh, which is what he did. And when he was in London, he befriended Charles Dickens and Benjamin Disraeli. So I think that gives you an idea of how quickly he sort of uh, moved to London and began to um, meet and, and start socialising with some really big names in the Victorian world. 
Um, the Royal Academy website states that his portrait sketches and paintings of famous friends and other celebrities helped to make his name. So he, he begins um, as this boy from Ireland, but then really sort of grows into quite a fashionable and successful painter. Um, by 1835, he's become an associate of the Royal Academy, so he's been voted in by his fellow artists. And then in 1840, he becomes a full academician. He was also a very well-known book illustrator, but where he really went on to make his name was producing history paintings. So that's scenes from literature and also Britain's historical past. And his most prestigious works um, in this type of art were for the interior of the new Houses of Parliament, which had been built following the fire, which just destroyed the original buildings in 1834. And here is not one of the um, paintings in situ, but this is a full-size sketch, uh, now in Auckland Art Gallery, for one of his works, Spirit of Chivalry, oh, sorry, Spirit of Justice, um, which is still in the Houses of Parliament now. He was um, commissioned to do a number of works. He was really favoured by the commissioning body, uh, which was led by Prince Albert. And in fact, they gave him a very, very ambitious cycle of works to do, uh, which were all related to Britain and the most recent uh, warfare that they'd been through um, with Napoleon. Um, and so only two of these, in fact, ever actually got put in. But they were Maclise, um, Maclise's meeting of Wellington and Blucher after the Battle of Waterloo, uh, which you can see here. This is um, in the Palace of Westminster. It's in the House of Lords. And then the other work, which I've mentioned before, is The Death of Nelson. And this is the finished study, which hangs in the Walker Art Gallery and is pretty sizable in itself. But clearly on the walls of the Houses of Parliament, it is really very grand. After painting the Waterloo scene and its companion piece, uh, The Death of Nelson, um, sadly, MacLeese's contract was cancelled due to the early death of Prince Albert, who'd been leading the fine art commissioners at Westminster. Um, and I, it was a commission that dragged on and on um, and really began to affect his health and his, his sort of mental um, health as well. And actually, he died in 1870 um, from pneumonia. And interestingly, that connection to Dickens goes really all the way through to his death because it was at the Royal Academy annual dinner that took place a few days after MacLeese's death. Dickens paid tribute to his old friend but it actually turned out to be Dickens' last public appearance as he died shortly after from a stroke. So I think that um, is something I would like to explore more as those connections with Dickens. But um, I thought that was a really interesting fact that I didn't know about MacLeese um, or about Dickens. So I'm turning now back to the, the picture, having given you a little bit of information about the artist himself. Um, and I here showing you the picture, um, which is one of the pretty big pictures in the picture gallery. Um, if you've been to the gallery before, you'll know that we've got some quite small paintings, but we do have some very large ones. And this one definitely does hold its own. It's not our biggest, but it does hold its own in the picture gallery space. So MacLeese completed this painting and exhibited it in 1857. And it's one of the moments in British history that the Victorians were extremely proud of, as it shows when the great nation of Russia came to England to learn how to build a navy. Um, so that's broadly the theme that's going on. But I wanted to look a little more closely about what is going on in the painting. So very specifically, it's a moment in time during Peter the Great's visit to England. And it shows a meeting in 1698 of Peter the Great. Now, he is the man on the left hand side who's got his hand on his hip and he's leaning on his knee and he's been soaring. So that is, in fact, Peter. Um, and on the right hand side, you see William III of England. He's the one who's uh, leaning on his walking stick and looking somewhat more sort of soberly dressed. And the two of them have met informally um, in the dockyard at Deptford. And this was one of the places 
Peter was most keen to visit when he came over to England um, because he was incredibly keen to build up a Russian Navy. Peter was actually traveling incognito, and this was very, very key to him, apparently. Um, so most of the time, he doesn't um, give himself all the sort of royal pomp and ceremony that he would be owed. Um, he very much keeps his meetings with William and other people very informal. Um, although he doesn't actually sign on as a carpenter in Deptford Dockyard, which is what he had done previously in the Netherlands, he nonetheless apparently couldn't help but get stuck in um, and start working alongside the carpenters. He had arrived incognito on the 11th of January 1698 and left on the 21st of April the same year. And he'd actually been invited by William to come to meet them. William and Peter had met when Peter was staying in Amsterdam um, in the Netherlands. And it was at that point William offered or invited Peter to come. So it was by invitation. Even though Peter is traveling incognito, it was by invitation. But why was Peter so keen to get to England? What was it um, about England and what was it about learning to build a navy? Why was he so hell-bent on creating this navy? Um, and the reason is that Peter was at war with the Turks. He didn't have a navy and he wanted to build one that would hold in check the Turkish fleet in the Black Sea. He also wanted to build alliances with other European powers fighting the Turks. Um, and the French had quite recently signed a treaty with the Turks. So that meant that they were not, power, were not a power that he was particularly interested in uh, building a relationship with. He wanted to build a relationship with Britain so that he had, I guess, more muscle behind him in this um, warfare with the Turks. So that really explains Peter and why he wanted to come to England. Um, I'll mention a little bit more about specifically England. He'd already gone to the Netherlands. Um, and he had spent time in their dockyard, as I say, signed on as a carpenter. So what was it that Britain was going to get out of helping the Russians? Um, and really, for the Britons, it was about trade. They were very happy um, to increase links with the Muscovite merchants. Um, because the merchants had raw materials that we needed in England, particularly for shipbuilding. So they wanted to be the buyers of these raw materials. But equally, they wanted, the British or the English merchants wanted a new market for their tobacco. And, you know, on one level, I was reading this and think, oh, you know, OK, tobacco widening markets. And then it um, went in the book that I was reading, the article mentioned that that tobacco came from Virginia. And it's at this point that then this picture um, sort of took on a new dimension for me, that although um, you don't overtly see the empire, it's there. It's very much a part of the history, um, and particularly this moment in time. Um, and that's really where I at first understood how it connected to Britain's colonial history and ambitions, because the tobacco that was being grown in Virginia was being grown by slaves in England's colony of Virginia. And in 1619, Virginia became the first English colony to import African slaves. And by the 1690s, enslaved labor was responsible for growing the tobacco crop that was then being sold by the English merchants. So this really does sort of begin to peel away a few layers of the onion um, and the sort of presence, the black presence um, that I was sort of um, looking for with the central figure um, and was expecting to find things relating to him, actually, I'd begun to find other details um, to really make me think more about Britain and its empire um, and sort of the idea of colony. There's also the issue um, with Virginia um, over in America, that it's a nod to settler colonization, which had seen the indigenous population lose their land to white English settlers. So on many levels, um, you're beginning to see this idea of colonization. Peter was extremely happy to visit England. Um, but one of the reasons 
that he was so happy is that he'd been told that the boats were the most sophisticated being built and superior to the Dutch. So this explains why, even though he'd been to Holland and spent this time in a Dutch dockyard, he actually felt he wasn't getting the best tuition, as it were, from the Dutch, and that he needed and was looking towards England, and why I think William and he um, sort of seemed to create this this trip uh, between them. They kind of cooked it up between the two of them. Um, what Peter felt was that the English way of shipbuilding was much more scientific and relied a lot less on the idea of traditions and experience. So when he was in Holland, what he was being told, I think, time and time again, is this is how we've always done it. You do it this way because this is how we've always done it. And you just have to learn the way that you um, have to learn the skills. And I think Peter felt that this wasn't going to give him the results he wanted quick enough. He wanted to build the Navy quickly. Um, and that what he felt was that in England, there was much more science and mathematics behind the shipbuilding. And that was something that he could export and take, either take skilled people with him or he might learn some of those skills himself. Um, MacLeese emphasizes, um, and I have to say this is a point that one of my students pointed out to me a few weeks ago during a class. MacLeese really emphasizes this idea of Britain being the giver of the knowledge and having the Navy, because if you look behind the figures in the background, you'll see that on the right, the scaffolding with a brand new warship. Um, and that warship is right above William. So William, it's very clear that William has this wonderful navy. He has the technology. But if you look behind Peter the Great, there is an empty scaffold. So it's very, very clearly um, shown by MacLeese that one of them has all the knowledge, and one of them is going to be learning the knowledge. So what we see in the painting is Peter, um, who is a very active leader. In fact, he was met, said to be seven feet, um, and MacLeese, I think, shows him in this very active, um, kind of very masculine um, pose, but that's partly, I think, to bring him in line with William. So in terms of height, they're equal. In terms of Navy, they're not. But in terms of height, they are. Um, but he is very active. William, in um, contrast, looks very quiet, looks very soberly dressed. Um, so it's quite an interesting contrast between the two. But I think that's partly because what was so well-known and parroted in Victorian Britain is just how active uh, Peter the Great was in trying to get these skills, that he just couldn't sit still and watch whilst his um, retinue learnt them for themselves. He had to learn them as well. Um, and he's shown with his retinue on the left, and that includes his trusted advisors, actresses, a person with dwarfism, and a black figure. And it's a very exotic grouping. And in fact, it's this wild group that was one of the most memorable facets of Peter's visit for the Victorians. Um, and it was mainly because um, this particular retinue had managed to destroy the interior fixtures and fittings of the house, which is called Say's Court, that Peter the Great was billeted in whilst he stayed near the dockyard in Deptford. In fact, it said that he knocked a hole in the side of the house to enable him to have direct access to the dockyard. So in a way, that's a symbol of just how enthusiastic he was about learning um, shipbuilding. Um, the owner of the house was the diarist John Evelyn, um, and he, as you can imagine, was not very um, happy about this. The English servants of the house called Peter and his retinue right nasty apparently, um, and that's very much something that the Victorians had in their mind. Um, and they described that no part of the house escaped damage. All the floors were covered with grease and ink, and three new floors had to be provided. The tiled stoves, locks to the doors, and all the paintwork had to be renewed. The curtains, quilts, and bed linen were torn in pieces. All the chairs in the house, numbering over 50, were broken or had disappeared, probably used to stoke the fires. 
300 window panes were broken, and there were 20 fine pictures, very much tore, and all the frames broke. The garden, which was Evelyn's pride, was ruined. So you can see that this is just the kind of drama that um, has really people have really enjoyed learning about Peter the Great and the thing that really sticks with them um, from his visit. MacLeese really has this in mind when he's depicting Peter and his retinue, but he is also referencing directly from an account of Bishop Gilbert Burnett, who accompanied Peter to several meetings with religious leaders in England during his visit. And his eyewitness account was thought to be, uh, was thought very highly of in the 19th century. So one of the things that Peter did, he wasn't just interested in learning how to build his navy. He really wanted to take in um, almost every facet of, of English life. And he had an awful lot of conversations with religious leaders. Um, and then when he returns to Russia, um, you can see that there is um, sort of some of the changes that his, the reforms he makes, particularly to do with the church, could well have been inspired by these visits to the religious figures. Um, in fact, this um, painting didn't actually have a title. Um, and MacLeese often did this when it was exhibited at Royal Academy Summer Exhibition. Um, what he did instead was give it um, a description. And so I'm just showing you um, two pages from the catalogue that the first curator at Royal Holloway, um, Charles William Carey, created um, for the early visitors to the picture gallery. And he copied verbatim the explanation that MacLeese himself had written um, and that was in the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition catalogue. So we know um, what text MacLeese was providing for people to understand better the painting. Um, and so I thought it was worth me reading it out as well as you seeing it. The first section is taken from Bishop Burnett. And Bishop Burnett says, Peter the Great, Tsar of Muscovy, working as a shipwright with his rough retinue on the dockyard at Deptford during the winter of 1697 to 8, is visited by William III in attendance on whom a lord's Carmathan and Shrewsbury and his president of council and foreign secretary. He, the Tsar, is mechanically tuned and seems more designed by nature to be a ship carpenter than a great prince. This was his chief study and exercise while he stayed here. He wrought much with his own hands and made all about him work at the models of ships. So that's Bishop Burnett's commentary with a little intro from MacLeese. And then we get a little bit more from MacLeese himself. He says, among those ordinarily about him, meaning Peter, while thus or otherwise occupied during his three months stay in England, the memoir writers of the time particularize as fellow workmen in the dockyard. Um, and then there are three of his followers, and I'm really sorry that Russian is not my forte, so I may not pronounce these very well. Menzikov, Golovin, Galatsin, and Prince Sibersky, the latter of whom was noted for his skill to rig a ship from top to bottom. They are careful to mention, as hardly less familiar companions, a dwarf, a negro boy, a monkey, who by excessive familiarity caused some alarm to King William on one of his later visits to Deptford and a young actress of Drury Lane. In St. Petersburg, I still kept the coarse woolen stockings and sailor's coat in which he worked, and the annual register of 1769 preserves the testimony of an old man, a Deptford shipwright in those days, who remembered well hearing his father say 40 years before that the Tsar of Muscovy worked with his own hands as hard as any man in the yard. So that gives you an idea of what the early audiences were being given by MacLeese to better understand the painting. Um, but equally, this is the first mention of the black figure. Um, and it's MacLeese himself who mentions him, which really struck me. So here is the figure. Um, although he is not one of the main figures, so he's not the main character. He's not Peter, he's not William. He is almost completely central in the picture. 
which I found really intriguing. Um, it's not the only time that Macleese had added black figures to historical scenes from England's past. And um, in the Houses of Parliament, in the Royal Gallery, there were the two large frescoes, which I've mentioned before, um, the meeting of Wellington and Blucher, but also the death of Nelson. So what I'm showing you is the death of Nelson, but I have picked out the two black sailors who are also there. So I hope that you can see those. In the Trafalgar fresco, there are two black figures. On the left is a black man who's tending to the wounded on HMS Victory, while close to Nelson, so again, really quite central, is another pointing out a target to a sharpshooter, possibly the same sniper who just shot Vice Admiral Nelson. So um, these are figures that, uh, particularly the one that's pointing out um, the sniper, they're really central to the composition and yet so easy to be overlooked. Um, I do think that McLeese, um, particularly when it came to the death of Nelson, might well have been inspired by John Edward Carew's um, death of Nelson section of the Battle of Trafalgar Reliefs, which adorn um, Nelson's column. So the first and most famous panel was the death of Nelson, and it was added in December 1849, and it very much does depict a black sailor fighting with the British Navy. Now, MacLeese was very keen to be seen as being historically accurate, and critics could be incredibly cruel if they sensed an anachronism. So if they weren't particularly swayed that the historical scene in front of them was authentic, they would treat you very harshly. Um, and obviously, what you want to avoid is bad criticism. What you really want is good criticism to help you either sell the picture or to get potential patrons. So artists did go to great lengths to um, connect themselves with the received historical text and include details that were deemed historically accurate. And one of the ways that um, MacLeese does this in the painting Peter the Great, if I just go backwards, um, is that he includes the details like um, the Bishop Burnett's um, speech in his, or his memoirs in his catalogue entry, but he also tries to reference portraits from the time. So the portrait of Peter, or the, the face of Peter the Great, is very much lifted from this portrait by Sir Godfrey Neller, um, which was um, taken, the portrait was painted when Peter the Great was visiting in 1698. So for MacLeese, who's trying to be historically accurate, he's gone to the very picture that he thinks embodies Peter and is the most accurate because it was painted at the time he came to visit. Other sort of details that he includes, again, reference things that were known about um, Peter's visit. If you can see in the bottom right corner, there is a model of a ship. And it was known that William had not only given the model of a ship to Peter to take away with him. Apparently, Peter was really um, obsessed by these models. He bought up lots of them. But he also, William actually gave him the real ship itself. Um, and so that was a gift. So again, MacLeese is referencing these things to make his audience and the critics uh feel as if this is very much very authentic scene. And I think the reason I'm sort of telling you that is that um, one of the reasons that he is including these black figures is I think because he thinks that that is adding a level of authenticity to the painting. So it's not a sort of Victorian attempt to be diverse. It is connected to their desire to be seen to be authentic. Um, in the case of the death of Nelson and, and that painting, it was very well known that there were several black sailors who were involved in that battle um, and were on board HMS Victory. And that was a very well known fact. So it would have been strange if he'd not included them. 
So almost by creating them in the crowd, he is creating this sort of level of authenticity. Here, I think it's more intriguing. It's not as clear cut as that. Um, although clearly, um, it was known that Peter the Great in his retinue had, um, black, or black servants. Um, so I think that's what Macaulay is referencing, that this was a well known thing that Peter kept black servants as part of his retinue, not just in England, but also in Russia. Um, and I think that's what Matisse is referring to when he mentions the Negro in his explanation of the scene, the Negro boy, he mentions that. Um, and one of the things that I found um, through my research is that it was actually not just known that he kept um, black servants, but it was known that during his visit to England, he actually purchased more black servants. And in fact, we even know the price he paid. So he bought black servants uh, for 21 pounds and two shillings. He also bought a negress for 30 pounds. So there seems to be some gender um, sort of distinction in this list of the things that he bought. And he bought 18 pairs of stockings for the blacks, um, and that was 18 shillings. So this is from a list of the things that he was buying. Um, just to add a slightly quirky element to other things that he was buying, um, I also discovered that he bought a lot of scientific instruments, which actually can be seen in this picture. Um, he sort of was going on these very grand spending sprees, um, clocks, instruments, and also a coffin, which I wasn't expecting. <laughs> Um, but apparently that was because British coffins were made using boards, uh, whereas Russian coffins were chiseled out from logs. And he felt um, that it was much more scientific to be made the British way. But I really wasn't. I was expecting to hear about the, the scientific instruments that he bought. But I really wasn't expecting to hear that he'd actually purchased servants whilst he was in England. And. In many ways, um, whilst he's doing that, he's actually following a fashion in Europe, um, in European royal courts, uh, but also within the upper classes, the wealthy merchants. And it's a fashion for having black servants. And it's one that is very well represented in paintings, um, such as this one. Um, this is a painting of Princess Henrietta, I think that's what it is. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm just moving that so I can, yeah. Princess Henrietta of Lorraine, attended by a page. And this is from 1634. This now hangs at Kenwood House. So um, about 60 years before Peter was visiting England. Um, but this is a tradition that went on for a long time. Um, I know from the research that I did that even the last Tsar of Russia had a number of black servants still in his household. Um, what I found out when I looked a little bit more, and what I wasn't clear is um, how much this applied to Peter the Great, but that often the, the black servants in the household um, were actually given a wage, um, they often had their freedom bought um, and then were given a wage and that there were often people, um, some of them coming from America who had previously been enslaved. There was quite a lot of competition to get those roles within the household. Um, but as I say, this certainly was all part of a tradition that started in Europe. Another thing that I found out um, that I was really, again, not expecting to find out about Peter the Great. Um, and the black presence within Russia and the black community in Russia was that he actually um, was gifted um, a young black boy who had been um, enslaved and kidnapped. They are still not sure exactly where he came from, um, but that Peter the Great then freed him and became his godfather and gave him the name Abraham Hannibal. And then, in fact, he actually sent Hannibal off to Europe to get a first class education in military and engineering courses. So um, Abraham Hannibal went over and studied in France. He worked as the emperor's secretary in France. So again, really quite 
um, quite high up in the social classes. Um, and he went on to become a Russian general under Peter's daughter's reign. And he was, in fact, the grandfather of the Russian poet Pushkin. Um, I, yeah, I was really surprised. I wasn't expecting to find that element in, in history or in Peter's history. Um, I think it's clear that there's a real ambiguity to those black servants um, and their position. Um, Queen Victoria herself had also, um, she had a goddaughter, I think was treated in a very similar way to Abraham Hannibal. But I think other servants, such as the ones that are being purchased in England, may not have had or enjoyed necessarily that same position within Peter's household. And so I'm just looking again at this figure that's in the painting. Um, and I think now if I look at the, the clothes of the figure, he really does appear to be in a livery. So livery there is the, the costume for servants that, that, that they were expected to wear. But it's interesting because when you see the bigger picture and you can see that he's holding on to the saw, like the Tsar himself, he's also taking a very practical role in acquiring knowledge of the shipbuilding. So that made me think, is MacLeese mistaking this figure or, or thinking that this figure is Abraham? Um, could he be thinking that because Abraham was a very well-known um, figure because of, the, I guess, the unusualness of his role within Peter's household? Um, and so could this sort of MacLeese be suggesting that this is Abraham who's learning um, about shipbuilding alongside the Tsar to go with his military training as well. But actually, I have then discovered that it's not possible because Abraham was only born in 1696. So that's two years before Peter's visit. So I think then in this case, this is a black servant that has come over with Peter um, and is expected like his master to be learning the shipbuilding. That he, the figure, I have had many thoughts about who he might be, um, because one of the things I did wonder at first before I read MacLeese's account that's from the catalogue is I did wonder because he's facing towards William and he's towards the right hand side of the picture, was he in fact an English carpenter in the dockyard? And I very recently, uh, last Friday, so very recently, um, visited a new exhibition at the Old Royal Naval College in Greenwich, which is called Black Greenwich Pensioners. And I would really highly recommend going. It's very small, um, but they do have really amazing social distancing. And it, it really was a very amazing, great exhibition, um, putting the spotlight on a really overlooked facet of the Greenwich Pensioners. But... That exhibition explores black mariners and pointed out that there was a black community in Deptford as early as the 1500s. So it's not impossible that this, in, I can see why I first thought that this was an English carpenter. Um, and around the time that Peter's visiting, there very much was a black community there. And they were involved with shipbuilding as well as actually going out to sea. They were very much involved with the building of ships as well. But because I'm referring to MacLeese's own words, in which he used to describe the scene to the first audience, um, it's clear that MacLeese means this figure to be connected to Peter. So he can't be one of the black community from England. Um, and in that way, he's acting pictorially as black servants did um, often in the portraits of their masters or mistresses. He's symbolizing the exotic. Um, and that was one of the, the many reasons why European royal families um, or the wealthy kept black servants in their households. Um, it was to sort of underline the sophistication of that household, but also the power and the wealth, um, the power to perhaps own land um, in areas where the, the black servants um, were from. Just that, that kind of globalness that they're trying to reflect to people. Um, and it's more evident, I think, when I consider the position of this figure in the painting. He is central, but in this way, because we've got Peter on the left and we've got William on the right, he becomes a barrier between those two nations. 
So he's central, but he's marginal because the focus isn't on him in the center. Often in history paintings, you'll find the most um, important figure is a central figure, but that really isn't the case here. In fact, you're almost at a pyramid with um, William on one hand and Peter on the other, and that very um, sort of active person above at the top of the, the pyramid. Um, so he's, he's kind of, yeah, this barrier between these two different countries. Um, and it's more apparent because he's sitting back to back with a person with dwarfism um, and a monkey. So apparently the monkey, as we've heard, flew at William in another of their meetings. So it isn't just that he is placed in the center, that he alone is this barrier, but actually he's there with the person with dwarfism, again, another symbol of sort of exoticism, and the monkey, yet another symbol. So they're there in this kind of buffer position, um, but I think they're very much there to symbolize the kind of wildness and exoticism of Peter and his retinue. So Peter was well known for having people with dwarfism in his retinue. He seemed to have been very intrigued by those with unusual genetic disorders, um, including being delighted to meet a giantess in England. And this might be because he himself was seven foot tall. Um, but the closeness to this figure, again, seems to show the artist is using the black servant as a signifier of the exoticness of Peter and his retinue. The other thing that struck me, actually, when I made um, this close-up that you can see, is that the black figure is shown in profile along with the monkey. The two of them are in profile together. And what um, that struck me is that what a common caricature of black men and women this was in the 19th century. Um, it struck me when I first saw the exhibition, The Black Victorians, um, and I hadn't forgotten that. And in a way, I'm surprised it took me so long, really, to spot it. Um, but it was this this feeling of superiority among, among white um, British or Europeans that in somehow um, other countries, um, Asian or African, were somehow less sophisticated, more, much more closer to animals. And that's kind of what's at the root of the caricature. But here it, it really just sort of hits you in the face, actually, just how close McLeese is putting the monkey and the, the black figure. Interestingly, although McLeese points out both the person with dwarfism and the black servant, there's no mention of either of those by contemporary critics. So the painting was sort of, it wasn't unanimously a success. In fact, it got quite a lot of criticism, but the criticism was for the static nature of the figures. Interestingly, though, the draftsmanship was being praised, so there was something static. So as I say, the contemporary critics seem oblivious to these figures who are right in the center of the picture. Um, but for me, now in the 21st century, what can I gain in some ways from the black figure and focusing on him rather than the main characters in the picture? And I think what I found really interesting is that the very presence of this picture in the picture, sorry, the very presence of this figure in the picture means that there was a reality of black presence in the 19th century in England. So it's not the case, if I show you some of the other paintings in the gallery, um, for instance, applicants for admission to the casual ward, which you see here, which is a scene of contemporary poverty, and also the railway station, which is a celebration of Victorian contemporary life. These are both contemporary scenes and you would not realize that there was a black presence if you look solely at these two pictures. Neither of them depict any black figures. But there does seem to be a distinct presence in historical scenes. And this is where Victorian art begins to reveal the presence of black communities in Britain. 
It's not the characters within the paintings that I'm talking about, but those who modeled for those characters in the 19th century and therefore show the real presence of those black communities. MacLeese is a Victorian history painter painted from life. And in order to create the likeness of the black servant in the painting, he will most likely have painted someone from the black community in London. And a really good example of this is Fanny Eaton. So here you see the same woman modeling three times for different um, artists. So on the left, you've got her, um, she's in a study by Joanna Boyce Wells. In the middle, you've got her, it's a drawing um, for one of Simeon Solomon's paintings. And on the far right, you've got Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the beloved, the bride. And she is the figure um, on the right hand side at the back. So she was, in fact, um, a charwoman, a cleaning lady. But she'd been spotted by Simeon Solomon and originally used by him as a model. And then other people in the artistic circle asked for her to sit for them as well. As Jan Marsh, the curator of Black Victorian says, artist models had a particular visual presence, providing painters with the figures for scenes composed in Britain, even when set in Africa, antiquity, or the land of imagination. Black figures appear in art in various roles, ranging from mischievous boys to harem attendants, from biblical characters to fictional figures. Frequently, they were virtually, mar virtually marginal servants or faces in the crowd. And that servants or faces in the crowd really reminded me of MacLeese, the death of Nelson, or here where although the black servant in Peter the Great is central, he's still marginal. Um, and the model for the, the figure of the black servant could, like Fanny Eaton, have been um, a professional model. So um, making money by sitting for artists, but also perhaps having another job or equally, he could just have been someone found by MacLeese and asked to sit because he fitted the bill um, and then actually had a completely unrelated day job. Um, and I know for a fact that um, in admissions for a casual ward, um, Files who painted that went off to see people um, who were trying to get into the casual ward of the workhouse and persuaded them to become a model for him. So it, it wasn't unknown for artists to just approach people off the street. As of 2005, when the Black Victorians exhibition took place, no black British artists were active, or no, they hadn't found any active black British artists in the 19th century. And as far as I know, that's still the case. So really what we're doing is relying on the white artists to portray this presence. And looking at those depicted in Victorian history painting um, as sitters, it's one of the ways which we can trace the black communities. But as Jan Marsh makes it clear, it shows us glimpses of the communities, but it doesn't help us understand better the black experiences. Um, interestingly, um, you have to rely quite heavily in the, uh, to understand the, the black communities in the 19th century, you have to rely quite heavily on the visual. The written records don't really reveal the true size of the communities. Um, in the 19th century, ethnicity wasn't recorded in the census or in other records kept by the bureaucratic Victorians, such as workhouses, which means that um, the black community is almost hiding. Um, and it's really by looking at the visual sources that you can piece that together. And back in 2005, one of the biggest sources, visual sources that people were using were the Bernardo's archives. So here what I'm showing you are um, photographs. Every child that went into Bernardo's was photographed. And so by looking through this archive, they were able to establish that there were quite a number of, of black children being taken in. And his, this was in fact the first black child that um, Bernardo's took in, John Lewis. And this became apparent to me all those years ago when I first saw the Black Victorians exhibition in Birmingham. And I think it's why the painting really drew me um, when I first arrived here. What I have discovered um, in a talk from Dr. Caroline Bressy um, just a couple of weeks ago is that now that we're digitizing more written documents like newspapers, 
it's becoming easier to search them by typing in um, different search words. So we have moved on from 2005. We're not solely reliant on visual as we were before. So why does exploring this figure in this painting matter to us now? And for me, it matters because I'm actively involved in reassessing artworks to draw out those who've been hidden due to their gender or ethnicity. Without this work, the real history of Britain can't be understood when so many voices are forgotten. In particular, this lone black figure hides in plain sight. He sits virtually slap bang in the middle of the painting, but he's in the background or on the margins of the narratives that Macleese wants to relate to his viewers. So I feel it's up to me to put him in the spotlight. And I hope this talk has illuminated an otherwise overlooked figure and helped find new ways of looking at this quintessential scene in British history and one that really fully displays much better, particularly in this month when it's Black History Month, um, gives a much fuller picture of Victorian Britain and potentially the Britain that, or the England that Peter um, discovered when he came to Britain.